Welcome to virtual worship at St. Mark's United Methodist Church for February 21st, 2021. Our announcements for the week are on the screen. Today is the first Sunday in the season of Lent, the 40 days before Easter Sunday. In this Lenten season, we'll be thinking about something Jesus told his disciples, that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And today we want to figure out how Jesus is our way, we are thankful you're joining us for worship. Let's join together in the call to worship. In you, Lord my God, I put my trust. I trust in you. Do not let me be put to shame, nor let my enemies triumph over me. No one who hopes in you will ever be put to shame. Let us worship the Lord.
During the Lenten season, we will be observing a time of confession and repentance each week with a prayer at our display on the platform. And this display contains symbols that connect to our theme, the way, the truth, and the life. The stones form a path that symbolizes Jesus as the way, and the cross symbolizes Jesus as the truth. The candles symbolize Jesus as the life because as John 1 verse 4 says, in him was life and that life was the light of all mankind. O oh God, early in the morning I cry to you. Help me to pray and to concentrate my thoughts on you. I cannot do this alone. In me there is darkness, but with you there is light. I am lonely but you do not leave me. I am feeble in heart, but with you there is help. I am restless, but with you there is peace. In me there is bitterness, but with you there is patience. I do not understand your ways, but you know the way for me. Restore me to liberty and enable me to live now that I may answer before you and before men. Lord, whatever this day may bring, your name be praised. Amen. Jesus, we follow you the way. Hi, kids. Hope you're having a good morning and hope you had a good week. So just a quick question for you. Do you know what a compass is? It's a tool, and it has a little needle inside, and the needle points to whichever direction you're going. And it always shows you where north is, so you can always find out which way you're heading. And it's a really useful little tool, but what's nice now is that if if your family has a newer kind of car, it probably has a compass, sort of a compass built in so that you always know where you're going. And your phones should have a compass app built in which always tells you where you're going and where north is. Now, right now, I find out that I am heading northwest and that we are actually at 370 feet above sea level elevation. Bet you didn't know that, huh? So, that's pretty handy to have a compass built into our cars and built into our phones. Maybe we should have a compass built into us so we always know what direction we're going. Maybe we do have one. So let's think about this. So in the Bible, Jesus told his disciples, this is in the Gospel of John chapter 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So Jesus was saying that anyone who wants to get to God just needs to go by way of Jesus. He's the way to get to God. So if we want to follow, if we want, if we want to find God, all we have to do is follow Jesus as the way. But what happens if we get a little lost along the way? How do we know if we're really following Jesus the way we should be? Well, that's where the Holy Spirit comes in. Because whenever we say yes to Jesus, and we ask Jesus to live in our hearts, he gives us the Holy Spirit. His Holy Spirit is with us all the time. And the Holy Spirit, you might say, is sort of our built-in compass. The Holy Spirit always tells us if we are going the right way with Jesus, or if we've sort of wandered off and we're going in the wrong direction. All we have to do is listen for the voice of the Holy Spirit. And his voice is very quiet. He doesn't often yell loudly, so we have to learn to pay attention to what he's whispering to us. And if we pray and ask him, he will let us know if we are going the right direction toward Jesus or if we're wandering off the, off the path, going the wrong way. So it's pretty nice to have a built-in compass but it's even better to know we have one built into us, and it's the Holy Spirit. So all we have to do is ask for help. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you that you are the way for us 
to get to God. Help us to listen for your Holy Spirit to show us and tell us if we are going the right way with you. We pray in your name. Amen. As we go to prayer, I invite you to uh, check our e-note for the list of prayer needs in the congregation. If you have any prayer requests, please uh, email the church office or call to add any requests that we need to be praying for. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we are beginning a new Lenten season in much the same way as we ended the last one. Still overwhelmed by the pandemic, still wondering when all this will end. Our last Lent was interrupted by the lockdown and how naive we were to think that in a few weeks, maybe by last Easter, we'd be through the worst of it and back together. Maybe it's a good thing that you didn't show us how long we'd be waiting for this to be over because we would have fallen into despair on the spot. But you have walked with us through this last year, through restrictions and sickness and death and fear, and you have watched over us in love. And now we do see hope on the horizon with vaccines coming, and Lord, oh, please bring them much faster. So we are praying that this Lent will end differently than the last one. Still, even if it doesn't, even if you are still God, you are still with us, we will still walk with you. We remember that Lent is the season when Jesus made his way to the cross, and we will journey with Jesus through our own fear and suffering and pain. Isn't it odd how we once thought giving up chocolate was keeping a holy Lent? Now we have a better idea what Lent is truly about because of this virus. Not that we wanted to know, but you bring good out of every evil, don't you? So help us to keep a truly holy land, Lord. Help us to examine ourselves, to root out whatever does not bring you glory, and to commit to following Jesus more closely. May we come to Easter ready to rejoice in the miracle of resurrection and new creation, remembering to count the cost to you of our own forgiveness in life. Bring healing to all who are sick and suffering, Comfort those who mourn, help those who are struggling. Break this pandemic, Lord, with the power only you have. So we enter into Lent with worship, offered from grateful hearts, through Jesus, our risen Lord. And as he taught us, so we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture today is taken from 1 Peter 3, verses 18 to 22. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. After being made alive, he went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits, to those who were disobedient long ago, when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water, and the water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also, not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. This is the word of God for the people of God. It was his love 
that sent him there. It was his love that breathed the prayer. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. I offer myself for you. It was his love. It was Jesus' love. It was his love that said, I offer myself for you. my sin upon the cross. It was my Jesus who paid the cost to set me free to live, to laugh and said, my grace is the gift I bring. It was his love, it was Jesus' love. It was his love that said, my grace is the gift I bring. his will that raised him up. It was his will that filled the cup with tender mercy that satisfies your soul. It was his said, rise up and let me see you whole. It was his love, it was Jesus' love. It was his love that said, rise up and let me see you whole. And let me see you. We are grateful for your support of St. Mark's because although we are wor worshiping virtually through February, St. Mark's is still touching lives through our ministries and mission. So here is one example from a key community ministry that we support with our giving and with our time, Mount Joy Helping Services. Good morning. I want to thank you first all at the St. Mark's for helping us over here at Mount Joy Helping Services. Uh, I don't think you really understand how great um, and all the pressure we've been under and with your donations and your food and the people that work here, we have nine to 10, nine to 12 people from St. Mark's that have worked here many more years than I have. And um, we're following COVID. Uh, we're following the list with the food donations. We had that great food donation that the kids put together. And I know a lot of you donated to that. Uh, everything was within a date. Uh, and actually, the, the kids in the afternoon actually sorted it for us. 
which was wonderful. They put it in boxes. They were so excited to do this. And then the Sunday group walked it over here. So I have pictures that I have taken, and I'm going to be displaying a uh, 3D um, board when the COVID's over so that you can all get a look at the kids and bringing things over. And they stayed here with me as I took them through um, Mount Joy through the food bank and they asked me questions. They told me what they would like to see in the bags um, and that kind of thing. They were really, really interested and uh, were blessed with great kids at our church. Um, also, the financial donations have been going to help us uh, with the bills that people have. This COVID has really affected so many families. And um, to tell you the truth, uh, the $600 is just not cutting it <laughs> when some of their rent is like $900. Landlords are not following no eviction. Uh, they're adding fees on to every day they're late. Um, and so it's been a real problem. So we've been dealing with landlords and PP&L and all the services that are available. And, but they have to go through a registration. Uh, they have to meet with me two months, for two months at least after we pay their bills. Um, and some of them we have to turn down because they're just they're spending their money and not paying their bills. So we thank you so much for this. Um, the church has been a blessing. Um, we love going there. And the community, I see more and more people asking, is that your church over there? And so I'm hoping we can get more and more people to actually start watching the programs and that type of thing. Thank you. Your giving makes it possible for us to touch lives through the work of Mount Joy Helping Services. Thank you for bringing your offerings to the church office or for giving securely online, which you may do by clicking on the link on the church website. Let us pray for the offering we will be receiving. Lord, the needs around us are overwhelming, and sometimes we wonder whether anything we do really makes a difference. But we remember that you call us to give what we have and let you take care of the rest. As Jesus took five loaves of bread and two fish and multiplied them to feed thousands. So we give what we have to you in the name of Jesus, our risen Lord and Savior, and we trust you to use our offering to meet the needs of many in his name. Amen. So we all think we know the best way to get somewhere, right? I certainly do. And a few years back, I had to go to a meeting at a church in Whitehaven up in the Poconos. So I plugged my destination into Google Maps, and I'm thinking Google Maps is going to tell me probably I-81 and then I-80. Instead, Google Maps said, take 222 and then pick up the northeast extension of the Turnpike in Allentown. And I said, why? That's insane. But Google Maps insisted this is the fastest way to go. Now, it made no sense because if you've ever been out 222 past Reading, you might know that it, it goes down to two lanes for a long stretch in the Kutztown area, and traffic can really back up, especially if there's a lot of trucks. I'm thinking, there's no way that this is the fastest way to go or the most efficient way, and Google kept saying, I'm telling you, this is. As it turns out, I hate it when, this is, when Google is right, but it turns out Google Maps was correct because it took me two hours and 15 minutes, even though I was driving through a snowstorm from Allentown up north on the, on the Northeast Extension. There were alternate routes, but it would have taken me longer. If you plug a destination into Google Maps, you are probably going to get some alternate routes, all of which will get you where you're going to go. But they might not get you there as quickly. Only one of them will get you there on time. So what about our final destination, 
eternity. Are there alternate routes? Is there more than one way to go? That's what we want to think about in this Lent season. We're going to be looking at and unpacking a statement that Jesus made to his disciples in John chapter 14. I am the way and the truth and the life. And we want to try to figure out what he meant and what that means for us. And we're going to start today, this first Sunday in Lent, with what he said when he, he said that I am the way. Is there more than one way to God? Actually, there's only one way, and his name is Jesus. So here we are in the beginning of Lent, and this is an appropriate time to think about the sixth of the seven great I am statements in the Gospel of John, I am the way and the truth and the life, because Jesus says this hours before he is arrested and then crucified. And Lent, of course, is the 40 days before Easter, not counting Sundays, when we prepare ourselves to go with Jesus to the cross. And when we think about where we are spiritually, and we examine our hearts, and we consider how we might come closer to Jesus. So in these 40 days of Lent, let's consider where we are in our spiritual walk with Jesus. So, and we're gonna pick up in, in John 14 and start at verse one. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip, even after I've been among you such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. And we're going to be coming back to this passage again and again throughout Lent. But again, this is hours before the arrest and crucifixion of Jesus, and he's trying to prepare his disciples for what's to come. And he says, I'm going away, and I'm going to prepare a place for you. The place is not so much a physical place, but a place with his Father. Because when Jesus goes to the cross, and then when he rises again from the tomb three days on the third day, he has prepared a place because he has made it possible for us to be forgiven, for us to be reconciled to his Father, and for us to have eternal life with him. And all of those things prepare the place for us with his Father. And he says, and I'm coming back so I can take you to be with me, and you know the way to the place where I'm going or you should, let's put it that way. And Thomas, who's never afraid to give voice to what everybody else is thinking, but it's a, who's afraid to say, says, we don't even know where you're going. How are we supposed to know the way? And that's when Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. The sixth of these seven I am statements in John. And in each of those seven I am statements, Jesus very deliberately refers to himself 
with the personal name of God that God reveals to Moses. Remember all the way back at the burning bush in Exodus chapter 3, verse 14, when Moses asked this God who was speaking to him for his name, God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. So when Jesus says, I am, he's telling his disciples something. He is saying, I am God in human flesh. And he is also revealing three critical truths about himself in this seven, six of seven I am statements. First of all, as he says, I am the way. The way is a pretty common description in the Old Testament to speak about how God wants us to live. To walk in God's ways is a common way of describing how we are supposed to be in God's presence. And just for just a couple of examples, let's look at Isaiah chapter 30. We're going to pick up at verse 19. People of Zion who live in Jerusalem, you will weep no more. How gracious will he be when you cry for help? As soon as he hears, he will answer you. Although the Lord gives you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, your teachers will be hidden no more. With your own eyes, you will see them. Whether you turn to the right or to the left, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way walk in it. Walking is the term in both the Old and New Testaments that describes the way of life. The way is how God wants us to approach him. And so let's go again to Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 16. This is what the Lord says, stand at the crossroads and look, ask for the ancient paths, ask where the good way is, and walk in it, and you will find rest for your souls. But you said, we will not walk in it, which was the problem Israel had. And then again, one more from Micah chapter 4, verse 2. Many nations will come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. And indeed, the, the law of Moses, the Torah, was said to be the way in which Israel could walk with God. But what's different about what Jesus is saying is Jesus doesn't say, I will show you the way. Jesus says, I am the way. He actually is the way to get to God. And not a way, the way. And that's the hard and challenging part. And as we go through this series, we're going to talk some more about why that is, why it is that Jesus is the only way. But let's, let me just throw out a few things to think about on that question to give you something to chew on, before, and we'll come back to this idea later on. Why is Jesus the only way to God? Only Jesus, only Jesus is God in human flesh. As he tells us and he tells his disciples again and again, seven times in the Gospel of John, I am. Only Jesus lived perfectly before his Father, the way that God intended all human beings to live. Only Jesus kept the law of the Lord, the way God intended the law to be kept. Only Jesus laid down his sinless life as a perfect sacrifice to redeem all of us from slavery to sin and death. Only Jesus rose from death bodily three days later to a new and eternal kind of life. Only Jesus, by this death and resurrection, has opened up the way to God's own throne. And this is what Hebrews chapter 10 tells us. 
beginning at verse 19. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain, that is, his body, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with a full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. Jesus has opened up the way to the very presence of God. He is the only way to come to God. And since he is the only way, what are we supposed to do about that? I'm just going to go out on a limb here and, and guess that most of you who are watching this service would agree that Jesus is the only way, that you have already made a commitment of your life to Jesus. And of course, that's the first thing that we all have to do uh, is that we have to put our trust in Jesus, that he is who he says he is, and he can do what he says he can do, that he is God in human flesh, and he can save us from sin, and he can reconcile us to the Father, and he can give us eternal life. All of those things are necessary for us to take that first step. Saved by grace, the grace of God, through our faith. But then after that, what happens then? That's just the first step. Then we have a whole life of discipleship. Our faith doesn't stop there after that first decision we make to trust Jesus. What does it mean after that first step that Jesus is the way? Let me suggest the most basic thing that means is that we have to follow Jesus. He is the way. We need to follow him. Consider that in the Gospels, 34 times Jesus says, follow me. That seems fairly clear. It must mean it's something he wants us to do. Sometimes we don't do it so well. But Lent is a very good time for us to think about how we can change the direction we're going. So let me just throw out four possibilities for four ways that we might need to think about whether we are following Jesus the way to God. First, we need to follow Jesus and his example. You see, yes, Jesus came to die for us, but his life up until the point of the crucifixion was not just a time filler. The incarnation of the Son of God was important from birth through resurrection and beyond. In his life on earth, Jesus showed us how God intends us to live, how to be fully human, which is something we lost back in the Garden of Eden. Jesus showed us how to live an intimate relationship with his Father and with other people. He showed us a pattern of balance between prayer and work and rest and pleasure, and he showed us how to serve. He showed us that we are intended to serve. He told us over and over that the greatest in the kingdom of heaven is the one who serves others. So we follow Jesus when we follow his example. That's one. We also need to follow Jesus to the places we would rather not go, out of our comfort zone. Don't you hate it when Jesus kicks you out of, our, out of your comfort zone, right when you're just feeling good about where you are? Jesus says, nope, let's keep going. But he does this throughout Scripture, so don't feel bad. He took Peter, that good Jewish boy, and kicked him straight into the home of Cornelius, a Roman centurion, and he had Peter baptize Cornelius and his whole household. I mean, not only is Cornelius a Gentile, but he's a Roman military officer. He took Paul, a Pharisee, and sent Paul over the entire Roman Empire, converting 
pagans to faith in the one true God through Jesus, he had Paul going straight into the household of Caesar. You talk about pulling people out of their comfort zones. That's just what Jesus does. And let me just point out, Jesus never asks us to do something he hasn't already done himself. Just for example, let's take a look at, at the letter to the Philippians, chapter 2, for, just for proof of this. Verse 6, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by being obedient to death, even death on a cross. Jesus didn't stay in his comfort zone in heaven, although he could have. He left his comfort zone to come, to become one of us, to save us. And he wants us to leave our comfort zones to join him in his mission of healing and helping and saving and serving a world that is suffering and dying for want of knowing him. We follow Jesus when we follow him out of our comfort zones. Third, we follow Jesus to the cross by taking up our own cross. And he warned us about this. He warns us over and over that all of his disciples are going to have to take up a cross. Just for instance, one example from the Gospel of Mark, and this is in Mark chapter 8. Verse 34, then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? Take up a cross and follow Jesus. So think of the cross that Jesus is referring to here as God's will for your life. The actual cross was God's will for Jesus. There are not many of us today who are going to be asked to die a martyr's death, certainly not on the cross. Although our brothers and sisters in countries around the world, they know what he's talking about, very literally. But for us, nothing like that. However, to take up our cross with Jesus means we are going to have to die to our self-will. We are going to have to die to our own agendas. We are going to have to die to our own plans for our lives and say yes to God's instead. Sound like fun? It's actually better than anything, anything that we could ever imagine. So, okay, here is the truth in advertising part of the message. Consider this like the terms of service on a website that no one ever reads, right? You just scroll down to the bottom and click, I agree. Well, see, the church doesn't really promote this a lot or make you really agree to this or read through it. But here's an uncomfortable truth about faith. I am convinced that to be a truly committed follower of Jesus, we are each going to have to go through the same kinds of things that Jesus went through. Humiliation, shame, suffering, pain. Death to some of the things that we think are important. None of us want to hear that. We like to think of the Christian life as being strength to strength, right? Victory to victory, glory to glory. Sometimes it is. But it is also learning how to walk with Jesus through the valley of the shadow of death. 
We follow Jesus when we follow him to the cross and take up our own. And then finally, we follow Jesus to glory because there is glory on the other side of suffering and pain in this world. Jesus has just gone ahead of us. He's gone ahead of us there. And he's in heaven. He's waiting for the right time, for the Kairos time, when he will come back and he will bring heaven in all of its glory, the kingdom of God in all of its glory to earth. And let's go back to Hebrews again. And we're going to pick up in chapter 1, verse 1. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom he also made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. Jesus is sitting at the right hand of God and he's ruling over creation. He's in glory. And 1 John 3 tells us someday we will be like him in glory. See, in Methodism, we like to talk about stages of grace, and we usually focus on the first three. Prevenient, the grace that brings us to the point of repentance, and justifying, the grace that makes us right with God, and sanctifying, the grace that gives us power over sin in our lifetime. But there's a fourth stage of grace, glorifying. It's the grace that we're going to experience when we see Jesus face to face. And that will be beyond anything we could ever imagine. And that's the reward for following Jesus. And you know what? I think after that, we're going to continue to follow him to new adventures beyond, again, beyond imagining. Follow Jesus to glory. So, which way are you going? How's your route taking going? Have you, are you on the right way? Or are you wandering off the path a little bit? We all do. And Lent is a really good time for us to take stock, to stop and say, where have I wandered off the way? Like I told the kids, the Holy Spirit is our built-in compass. He can stop us and point us back in the way, Jesus. So in this season of Lent, let's pause to think, where am I? Am I following Jesus, his example? Am I following Jesus out of my comfort zone? Am I following Jesus to the cross and carrying my own? And am I following Jesus someday to glory? Because there really is only one way to God, and his name is Jesus, and he loves you more than words can say. Let's pray. Oh, Lord, as we begin our Lenten journey, we thank you that you loved us so much that you sent Jesus to live for us and then to die for us and then to live again for us. Help us to remember that Jesus is the way that we come to you and help us to come to you more closely throughout these 40 days of Lent. We lift up this time, this season of confession, repentance, and preparation to you and ask you to bless it and bless us. Through Jesus our Lord, amen.
It's your body and your blood you shed for me. This is how I fight my battles. There's a table that you've prepared for me. In the presence of my enemies. It's your body and your blood you shed for me. This is how I fight my battles. Receive the blessing of the Lord. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and then how inscrutable his ways. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Brothers and sisters, go in peace to serve the Lord and to follow his way. Amen.